Hi, welcome to the unabridged audiobook for Undead Ultra. I'm Apocalypse author Camille Peacott. If you enjoy this content, please support me and my books by subscribing to this channel and hitting the notification bell so you can be alerted when new audiobooks and new book-related content is posted. I hope you enjoy the story. Thanks for tuning in. Chapter 45 Out of Gas As Alvarez predicted, the road north of Laytonville is a lonely one. It narrows to two lanes. Oak trees have completely disappeared, replaced by tall pine trees. I drive with the windows down, using the cold air to keep me awake. We're barely a mile gone from Rod's roadhouse when the jeep gives a wicked cough. Alarmed, I look down at the dashboard and find the gas light on. Fuck! I slam one hand against the steering wheel. Fuck it all, can't we catch a break? I'd been so busy fretting over my unconscious friend that I hadn't thought to check the fuel gauge. The car makes it another half mile, coughs two more times, lurches, and then dies. I sit there in silence, listening to the soft click and hiss of the dead engine. What am I going to do? I will not cry, I tell myself resolutely. I've cried enough already. Feeling sorry for myself isn't going to help anything. I mull over my options, realizing there isn't much I can do. I can't carry Frederico, and I can't leave him here. The only thing I can do is wait for him to wake up. Afraid to stay inside the car and be exposed, I retreat a short distance into the woods and deposit a trash bag of food I'd scavenged from Rod's roadhouse. Then I get Frederico's limp form out of the car. Looping my hands under his armpits and around his chest, I drag him into the woods. It's slow going, but I manage. I drop him onto the ground and roll him onto his side. He emits a soft snore. Exhaustion swells within me. Every ache in my body makes itself known. My tired, blistered feet, the bullet wound in my shoulder, the aching knee from my early fall, exhausted, sore arms, stiff back, even just the short ride in the car was enough to make my leg muscles tighten up. Patches of rash from the poison oak have started to pop up on my arms. It's six-thirty. We've been on the move and awake for almost thirty-three hours, and we still have a long way to go. I decide to sleep for thirty minutes. It will give me a much-needed boost and hopefully be long enough for Frederico to wake up from his stupor. I set the alarm on my watch. Then I curl up on my side, pressing my back against Frederico's, and close my eyes. I'm yanked from the depths of a dreamless slumber by the sound of someone throwing up. I bolt upright, breathing hard, unaware of where I am or what's going on. Drool and pine needles stick to my cheek. It all comes crashing back. Alicia, Alvarez, the stupid out-of-gas jeep. Frederico. Frederico. I turn to find my friend sitting up on his knees. His back is hunched as bits of vomit stream from his mouth. He heaves two more times, then wipes his mouth with the back of his hand. You should have left me behind, he says, not looking at me. I'm not worth your effort. Bullshit, I reply. You're my best friend. I'd never leave you behind. What happened to the soldier? Went south to Ukiah. Silence. I don't want to fill it with useless epithets. Instead, I stay quiet, waiting for him to speak. He sips on his hydration straw, rinses his mouth out with water, then takes several long drinks. Finally, he lifts his head and turns haunted eyes on me. What did you do with her body? His anguish pierces me. Alvarez and I buried her behind the bar. Thank you. He closes his eyes, a few tears leaking down his cheeks. 
I... He stops, swallows. I couldn't bear to look at her, to see what I'd done to her. You did right by her, I interrupt. I know it was awful, but you did right. He says nothing. I try to think of something comforting to say, but come up empty. What words of comfort are there for a parent who's lost a child? I hope Brandon is safe, he says, speaking of his son on military deployment. I hope I die so I never have to look him in the eye and tell him how I failed his sister. He makes eye contact again. I feel dead. I lost Alicia and lost my sobriety. At a loss for words, I reach out and take his hand. There's nothing I can say to patch up the hole in his heart. That's when I notice the long shadows and the chill rising from the ground. I lift my wrist, thinking the alarm must be about ready to go off, and see that it's 7.45. Oh, shit! I jump to my feet, wondering why it didn't go off. Another look shows me the alarm did go off. Almost forty minutes ago, I slept right through the beeping. What's wrong? Federico asks. It's almost eight, I say. We need to get back on the road and get in more miles before dark. Without our headlamps, we won't be able to go very fast once the sun goes down. I see the skepticism in his face and raise my hand to forestall him. I got a hold of Carter. He's alive with a few friends. They're holed up in the dorm lounge. Emotions churn over his countenance. I see surprise, relief resentment, and then sadness. I understand it all. Help me find him, I say. Please, I can't make this run without you. He nods and awkwardly gets to his feet. There is soreness and stiffness in every movement. Inventory, I say to him. My IT band is being an asshole. Always is on anything over fifty miles. And I'm hungover. You? Knee hurts like a son of a bitch. I could use a clean pair of socks. Though I don't say it, my arms feel like lead, my shoulders ache from the pack straps, and my legs feel like jelly. The chafing from my sports bra is a bright throb. The poison oak patches have spread in the past hour, and, of course, the gunshot wound hurts like a son of a bitch. I don't bother listing the complaints, just as I know he's holding back from me. You can't run as far as we have without hurting like hell. Part of Ultra's is running through pain and running despite pain. I got a little food. I gesture to the garbage bag I brought from Rod's roadhouse. No time. Federico replies, We can't burn daylight eating. Besides, I don't feel like eating. I nod in understanding, relieved he's agreed to get moving again. We've already lost enough time. I hurry to the car, grimacing at the stiffness of my body from the short rest. I swing my good arm and rotate my torso as I walk, trying to loosen things up. For all that I was too afraid to sleep exposed in the jeep, we're alone on the road. I spot a stream of iridescent liquid running out from beneath the car. It's made a small pool next to the front passenger tire. A light bulb goes off in my head. I didn't take a car with an empty gas tank. I took a car with a leaky gas tank. We're lucky the damn thing didn't explode. I step up to the car and rummage through the glove compartment, hoping to find a flashlight. Some good rifling doesn't produce a much-needed flashlight, but I do find a handful of condoms, a wad of McDonald's napkins, and a melted Snickers bar. Carter loves Snickers, I say as Frederico comes out of the forest to stand beside me. I used to buy him a Snickers bar for every A he got on his report cards. He insisted I keep up the tradition through his senior year. You should save that for Carter, Federico says. Save what? The Snickers bar. It's so... I turn the bar over in my hands. 
melted. He shrugs. It's still a Snickers bar. He has a point. I tuck the lumpy chocolate bar into my pack, imagining Carter's face when I deliver it to him in Arcata. I gotta take a leak. Frederico moves stiffly to the far side of the car. I resist the urge to ask him if he's okay. It's a stupid question. And besides, it doesn't matter how he feels. It doesn't matter how either of us feels. We have to move. Staying stationary is not an option. I decide I'd better go, too. I squat on the side of the road. I try to gauge the color of my urine. The darker it is, the more dehydrated I am. Though it's hard to discern the exact color in the shadows, it's darker than I like. I could use a few electrolyte tablets. Federico calls to me from the other side of the car. They'd help with a hangover. My head feels like it's splitting in half. I think I could eat electrolyte powder straight out of the bottle, I call back. Though not for a hangover. I straighten gingerly, every muscle in my body screaming. What would you rather have right now? I ask Frederico, pulling my pants up. A hot tub? Or electrolytes? Ibuprofen, he replies. A whole fucking bottle. Yeah, I hear you there. I move toward the front of the car. There's a slight dip between the asphalt and the dirt. As I scan the highway, my foot hits it at an awkward angle. I stumble. My ankle rolls, and I go down. Chapter 46 Suffer Better As I fall, something pops in my ankle. Kate! Federico darts around the car to me. Pain shoots up my ankle. I stagger, catching myself. I take long, gulping breaths, nostrils flaring as I fight back the pain. Federico grasps my shoulder, the two of us looking down at the ankle. No doubt it will begin to swell in the next few minutes. I think I twisted it. God, please don't let it be a sprain. I lean over my good knee. Goddamn rookie mistake. I know better than to take my eyes off the road. Damn it. Frederico touches the side of my face, forcing me to look up at him. This isn't the end. Your ankle will swell up. That will act as a natural splint. You can run through this. This time I do laugh, though it's a pained noise. As crazy as it sounds, what he says is true. There are ultra-runners who have finished races with fucked-up ankles. Just not very many of them. That's the sort of thing badass elites do, I say. Not normal middle-of-the-pack runners like me. This wouldn't have happened if I wasn't so tired. It's too easy to make mistakes when exhaustion sets in. Carter doesn't even need me. Not really. I rub tiredly at my face. God, my ankle is on fire. He's a grown man. I need him, Frederico. This is the naked, humiliating truth. I lost Kyle and he's all I have left. I'm out here running to Arcata because my son is the only reason I have to live. Tears well in my eyes. Fuck your twisted ankle, Frederico says ruthlessly. I lost my daughter. My baby. All I want to do is lie down on the side of the road and die. But I am going to keep running. You're going to do the same. Now move. We're finishing this run if it kills us. I nod, pushing myself upright. He's right. Despair and self-pity are demons that nearly devoured me when Kyle died. I can't let that happen again. Remember what Kyle used to say when he crewed races for us? I ask. What? The bit about suffering better? Yeah. I swing my arms, pushing the agony of my ankle into a small part of my brain. Suffer better, babe. Ultra runners suffer better than most people. That's what Kyle meant. 
You can't take up a sport like ultra-running if you aren't good at suffering. It doesn't matter how much you train. Racing long distances hurts. Sometimes it hurts a little. Usually it hurts a lot. That's what happens when you pound the hell out of your body. Which raises the question, why do something that hurts? On purpose. It's a question all long-distance runners get asked. The answers are as varied as the people. Hey, Mom. Carter greeted me with a chipper smile at the 40-mile aid station on the Cactus Road 100-miler. He passed me a baggie of electrolyte tablets. Guess what? What? I dug around in my gear bag, looking for some disinfectant wipes. The desert plants had sliced the shit out of my arms and legs, and I wanted to clean the wounds before heading back out. You've never been any closer to the finish line. I pause, raising one eyebrow at my son. I've got another sixty miles to go. Yes, but you've still never been closer to the finish line. He made a goofy face, crossing his eyes and touching his tongue to his nose. It was impossible for me not to laugh. I leaned back in the collapsible chair he'd set up for me, letting the humor ripple through me. Is this what you're looking for? He passed me a Ziploc filled with single-wrapped disinfectant wipes. Yeah, thanks. I rip open one of the packages, wiping the disposable cloth up and down my arm. My skin stung in response. The director of the Cactus Rose was famous for saying that everything on the course stung, scratched, or bit. There was no way to run this course without getting bloody. In fact, there was a demented pride that went along with getting beat up by the trail. "'Where's your dad?' I asked as I finished cleaning up my arms. I leaned down to start working on my legs, which had twice as many cuts as my arms. Napping in the car, Carter replied. He watched in silence as I wiped up a long streak of dried blood. Hey, Mom. Yeah, honey? Why do you do this? Do what? This. Carter gestured emphatically to the surrounding desert. Ultra running. I mean, you could run half marathons or things like that. Easier races. Why do you always pick the hard ones? I took a long drink of water, considering my answer. Carter's question was one I'd asked myself periodically over the years. Sometimes I ran to burn off stress. Sometimes I ran to work off a particularly large bowl of ice cream. Other times I ran for the sheer joy of the sport. But underneath all that was another, more profound reason. There are a lot of reasons, I said at last. If I had to boil it down, I'd say I run ultramarathons to learn about myself, to find myself. You can't run 100 miles without learning something. Crossing the finish line of an ultra, I shrugged, struggling to find the right words. There's nothing like it. I find new places inside myself on every race. Carter took that in introspective silence, passing me a clean pair of socks. You should put these on. Dad says you don't blister as badly if you change your socks halfway through. I passed the socks back. I'll get them at the next aid station. Today. Right now. I am running with a new reason. I run to find my son. I'm running toward Carter, toward my family. If ever I had a reason to suffer better, today is it. Perhaps the last twenty years have been nothing but a series of training runs for this, the ultimate run, the run to find my son. I don't think I really understood the meaning of suffering until today, Federico says. His voice is brittle his face lined with grief and sorrow. I fumble with a front pocket in my pack and pull out a small paper towel filled with espresso beans. Here, I say, holding a few out to him, 
I took them from the espresso machine in Rod's roadhouse. They'll help us stay awake. The corners of his mouth turn up, but the smile doesn't touch his eyes. He plucks a few out of my hand and tosses them back like they're pills. Then he starts to run. I fall in beside him. My body shrieks in protest. It's a good ten minutes before things loosen up and I find myself slipping into a rhythm. The ankle, already swelling, tells me to sit the fuck down, but I ignore it. I push the pain to my periphery, focusing instead on putting one foot in front of the other. I hear Kyle's voice in my head saying, Suffer better, babe. Suffer better. The road climbs away from Leightonville. Though it undulates, there's a steady rise in elevation. We lean into the hills, pumping our arms to help propel us upward. The downhills bring some relief as we let gravity pull us forward. My calves burn. My lungs rasp. My arms ache. My ankle tells me I'm the biggest fucking idiot on the planet. I tell my ankle to shut the hell up. The sun sinks lower and lower. It becomes harder and harder to see. I lament the loss of our headlamps. I think we've crossed into the part of the race where we can't be wimps, I say. Are you kidding? I hit that point fifty miles ago. I'm just faking it till we make it to Arcata. Mile 132 Pain is a state of mind. Running is a state of mind. I am the runner, not the pain. The road is dotted with big yellow and red signs advertising Confusion Hill. It's one of the many tourist traps dotting the 101. Carter and I didn't stop at Confusion Hill when I helped him move north to college. I'd battled a storm of emotions that day. Pride, because I was sending a kind, responsible, hard-working young man out into the world. Joy, because Carter was getting an opportunity I never had. Fear, because I was afraid of how I would cope with being alone. Sadness, because experiencing this day without Kyle felt fundamentally wrong. I dragged out the drive as much as I could. I forced him to stop at several goofy tourist traps, like the drive through tree and the chimney tree. We hadn't stopped at Confusion Hill, though. Tears well in my eyes. Why didn't we stop? Why didn't I insist on one more goofy memory before sending him off into the world? Why am I crying over some stupid tourist trap I've never been to? I don't even know what Confusion Hill is. Mile 134. It's dusk. Another red and yellow sign looms in front of us. It says, Approaching Confusion Hill. The road curves. The left side of the road drops off in a near vertical slope. The right side, equally steep, is terraced with a tall stone retaining wall. Between the darkness and the curve in the road, our vision is limited. As we round the corner, my eyes are dazzled by a sudden brightness. Before us is a jumble of neon lights, eye-tingling red and yellow signs and brightly colored flags strung through the redwoods. Confusion Hill. We have arrived. The tourist trap is nestled next to a bridge that spans the Eel River. The river lies just past the parking lot, down a cliff tangled with redwoods and ferns. Anyone driving over the bridge can't help but get an eyeful of Confusion Hill. It's a prime location for snagging tourists. There are a few cars in the parking lot. Bordering the asphalt lot is a chain-link fence, presumably protecting the secrets of Confusion Hill from the unpaying populace. Behind the fence are a few zombies. Lucky for us, it appears traffic was light when the zombie apocalypse came through. The tapping of our feet has alerted the zombies to our presence. Trapped behind the chain-link fence, none are in a position to come after us. They rattle the fence at our approach, moaning and snapping their teeth. One lets out an awful keen that raises the hairs along the back of my neck. An answering keen fills the night. But it's not from an undead in Confusion Hill. 
It's from somewhere off to our left, in the woods. Something large and black blots out the forest to our left. I'd been so focused on Confusion Hill, I hadn't paid attention to the other side of the road. What is that? Frederico whispers. The big black shape solidifies in my vision. It's a big tourist bus. The reason we can't see it very well is because it's laying on its side, its dark undercarriage barely visible in the night. Several more keens rise up from the other side of the bus. Then a rush of bodies swarm around the vehicle toward the road, coming straight for me and Frederico. Chapter 47 Tourist Trap The zombie tourists are Asian, every last one of them sporting a camera around the neck. They rush en masse, cameras bouncing on their chests as they run. Shit! I squeal. Run, Frederico! I break into an all-out sprint, tearing toward the bridge. My fear numbs the pain in my ankle. Frederico hauls ass next to me. The foremost of the zombies, five of them all together, come around the front of the bus and angle toward us at a run. Their blind trajectory will cut us off from the bridge if we don't move faster. Another three dozen Chinese tourists pour around the back of the bus. Fuck! We can't stop to fight the zombies in front of us to clear the path. If we don't beat them to the bridge, we're going to be trapped. Faster! Federico yells. I pour every last ounce of speed I have into my tired legs. My arms pump, my breath rasps, my legs churn as I lean forward, straining toward the bridge. The first of the zombies reaches us, arms outstretched. With a feral shout, Frederico angles his left shoulder and plows straight into the beast. The monster flies backward, skidding across the pavement on his back. Frederico never slows. I maintain my course, sprinting beside my friend. We outpace the other four zombies, our feet hitting the bridge before they catch us. Behind us, an eerie keen fills the dusk. We have an entire undead tour bus on our asses. There's no hiding from them. A few well-thrown rocks won't save us this time. Push hard, Frederico says. Push hard and lose them. It's the only way. Mile 135 Despite the hangover I know he has, Frederico sets a grisly pace. We manage to put a solid one hundred yards between us and the undead. We're not sprinting, but we are running hard. I'm not sure how long we can maintain the lead. Their awful keening follows us through the night. They are hunters, and we are the prey. No pain, no pain, no pain. This mantra rolls through my mind as I run. Mantras are an ultra trick I picked up somewhere, though now I can't recall who gave the advice. No pain, no pain, no pain. If you lie to yourself long enough, you actually start to believe it. Mile 137. My mantra changes. Don't be a wimp. Don't be a wimp. Don't be a wimp. Hunger gnaws at me from the inside out. It battles with my physical pain. I battled both of them. I can't remember when my hydration pack ran dry, or when I had my last drink. I'm bonking. Again. The last two days have been an unending series of bonks. Don't be a wimp. The zombies are still behind us. They aren't gaining on us, but we aren't widening the gap, either. Frederico keeps a close eye on the zombies. He pushes us hard, so hard. Mile 139. The zombies have narrowed the gap to 75 yards. They're gaining on us. We're high in the mountains, the darkness a deep umbrella around us. I miss our headlamps. If we had lights, we could take to the forest and try to lose the zombies. With only the stars and a sliver of moon in the sky, there isn't nearly enough light for us to risk the woods. They've only been chasing us for five miles, which isn't all that far. If Frederico and I were at the start of this insane junket, we could lose them. I'm sure of it. But we've been on the move for almost two days straight. We're beat to shit and exhausted. 
one foot in front of the other. That's our only option. Are we just delaying the inevitable? Mile 141. Fifty yards and closing. My whole body hurts from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes and everything in between. My head screams for me to move, to pick up the pace, but my body can't comply. I begin to think death wouldn't be a bad option. Yeah, it would suck to get eaten to death, but with the throng of zombies behind us, it would probably be quick. Running another fifty miles at this pace seems like slow torture. What if we just ran off into the woods? How far could we go before one of us fell and broke something? Maybe, if we were lucky, we'd both run straight over a cliff and break our necks. Death would be swift. That wouldn't be such a bad way to go. At least we'd die running. If only we could find a cliff. Mile 142 I try to focus on the road, on my form, on mentally managing my hunger and pain. I feel like the unraveling hem on an old pair of jeans. My eyes flick out to the forest. Should we try it? Brave the woods in the dark? I imagine tripping on a log and breaking my other ankle, or knocking myself out on an errant low-hanging branch. In the daylight we'd stand a chance. In the dark we'll be dead meat. I hurt, I gasp. Everything hurts. Frederico, eyes glued to the road, doesn't look up when I speak. Yeah, he agrees. I recognize the set lines in the profile of his face. He's bonking, too. He might not have a fucked-up ankle, but he's got his own physical pain. Mile 144. Twenty-five yards and closing. The zombies are running us into the ground. Frederico and I are barely holding on. We're hungry, tired, and hurting. We're two steps short of roadkill. How much farther can we get before the undead catch us? We're nearing another bridge. Maybe we should jump off, throw in the towel, and just end it. Kate. When Frederico says my name, I sense the depth of our friendship in the word. You're a finisher, Kate. Don't let yourself forget that. You might not look pretty when you arrive at the finish line but you always arrive. He pushes a small bundle into my hands. In my exhausted, pain-riddled state, I take the objects automatically, barely noticing them. Federico smiles at me. The moon and stars cast the lean angles of his face into planes of shadow and light. Strands of curly gray hair escaping from his ponytail create a fuzzy halo around his face. Tell Carter Uncle Rico says hi. Then he does something strange. He lets out a long, loud, wordless holler. Then he turns and sprints away from me. His yell lashes the night with sound. The zombies, zeroing in on the sudden noise, let out a collective keen. Chapter 48 Run, jackalope. I sway on my feet, staring stupidly after Frederico in incomprehension. To the right of the bridge is a small, single-lane road. I hadn't seen it until now. It's onto this road that Frederico runs. The tourist zombies stream after my friend in an undead rush. Frederico bellows into the night. Run, jackalope! God damn you, run! His words are like a pair of jumper cables to my brain. Understanding fills me with horror. Run, jackalope! I turn and run. Gone is the pain of my swollen ankle, of all the little aches and pains that have accumulated over the last 144 miles. Gone are the fatigue and the hunger and the thirst. Crowding all of it away is frantic grief. 
Run, jackalope! His words, faint in the night, drive me forward. My legs churn over the black asphalt. I sprint over the bridge and away from my friend, tears running down my cheeks. The bridge spans a wide gorge, crossing yet another section of the Eel River. Free of the trees, the landscape around me brightens under the light of the moon and stars. Something moves to my right off in the distance. Without slowing, I turn my head. Half a mile away is the narrow, single-lane road. It leads away from the 101 and winds down to the river below the bridge. Frederico sprints down that road, the horde of zombies on his heels. His wordless yells and whoops echo into the night, a beacon that draws the zombies the way flowers draw bees. The intensity of the noise sets them into a frenzy. The keen, voices filling the air like a discordant church organ. Frederico, pouring on one last burst of desperate speed, has perhaps fifty yards on them. But the zombies are gaining. Even when they trip or veer off the road and run into a tree or trip over a bush, they gain on him. I grind to a halt in the middle of the bridge, breath catching in my throat. I stretch out a hand as if I can somehow reach my friend from here. Frederico! My throat, parched with thirst, turns the word into an anguished croak. He doesn't hear me. He's focused on the road, on keeping as much road as possible between him and the monsters. The gap has narrowed to twenty-five feet. His body is giving out on him. The miles and miles of running have taken their toll. The tiny road disappears from sight, winding beneath the bridge. I race to the opposite railing, following Frederico's progress with my eyes. His road snakes away into the trees, disappearing from sight. As he nears the trees, still shouting, there's only ten feet between him and the undead. Maybe he senses my anguished gaze. Maybe he just wants one last look at the world. Or maybe he's looking back at the zombie horde bearing down on him. Whatever the reason, Frederico pauses to look back and up. Even in the dark, even with the distance separating us, I feel it when our eyes meet. A silent goodbye hangs in the night between us. That single word is a giant, imploding echo of nothingness. And then he's gone, disappearing into the trees disappearing from my life. Tears pour down my cheeks. I turn, sprinting away. A single, solitary scream breaks over me like a crashing wave. I feel myself drowning in it. The screaming stops, abruptly cut off. I choke on a sob. I pump my arms, running away away from the death of my friend, away from the sorrow that wraps around me like a constrictor, away from every heartbreaking pain life has delivered me. Frederico dies so I can run. His non-existent voice rings in my head. Run, jackalope. Chapter 49 BFF. My eyes snap open. The first thing I see is a spider web. A multifaceted silk hangs delicately from a small shrub, the strands bedecked with pearls of dew. Frederico. His name hangs in my mind like that spider web, shining and impermanent. There's a Frederico-sized hole in my heart, right next to the Kyle-shaped hole. Where am I? I push myself up into a sitting position. My body screams from the movement, demanding I lie back down. I ignore it. I'm somewhere in the forest, a canopy of redwoods towering above me. Damp earth and pine needles stick to my cheek, torso, and arms. Frederico. It doesn't matter how far or how hard I run, I'll never escape the grief and emptiness. 
Guile. Gritting my teeth, I push myself into a standing position. My swollen ankle throbs. I consider pulling off the shoe and sock to inspect it, but quickly dismiss the idea. If I take the shoe off, I'll never get it back on. I make up my mind right then that the damn shoe isn't coming off until I get to Arcata. It's seven in the morning. I've been on the move for forty-five hours. My watch shows me at mile one hundred forty-seven. How long did I sleep? I don't even remember how I got here. My eyes are swollen from crying. My nose is clogged with snot. Hunger scrapes at my insides. My tongue is parched. My body feels like it's been pounded with a hammer, which in fact it has. Pain is irrelevant. Hunger, too, is manageable, at least for now. Hydration, however, is neither irrelevant nor manageable. I need to get some liquid into my body. Soon. I won't make it far if I'm too badly dehydrated. Lack of water can lead to kidney malfunction, which has forced many a runner into a DNF. That is not going to be me. Not today, at least. My mind flashes briefly to a documentary I saw on Genghis Khan. His warriors drank blood from their horses to stave off dehydration in the desert. Any horses around? I wonder. I have a brief vision of me catching a horse, slicing its flank open with a knife I don't have, then draining some of its blood into my hydration pack. I bark a mad, desperate laugh. Something crinkles under my hand. I look down and see a small pile of stuff on the forest floor. There's half a candy bar and a small ziplock with needles, sterile wipes, super glue. A blister kit, I realize. Like the one Federico and I put together after we raided that abandoned RV. Thoughts of last night flood back. I have a vague recollection of Federico shoving things into my hands before he led the zombies away from me. My eyes swell with tears. Did he give me these things? Did I carry them all this way? Federico lost everything yesterday. His daughter, his sobriety, and his life. He sacrificed his sobriety for Alicia, and his life for me. Tears spill down my face. I blink them away. Now is not the time to cry. Not when I'm already dehydrated. I tuck the blister kit and half-eaten candy bar into my pack. Logic tells me I should tend to my feet, or at least my good foot. But I'm too tired. And honestly... I just don't give a fuck about blisters right now. Even so, having the little kit makes me feel like I have a tiny piece of my friend still with me. He's dead, you idiot, says a nasally voice. There ain't no piece of Frederico left anywhere. My head whips round. Standing beneath a tree only five feet away is a dun-colored rabbit with tall ears. Rising above his ears are a pair of antlers. My stomach drops at the sight of the jackalope. I quickly turn away, pretending not to have seen or heard him. Now is not the time for a hallucination, especially an antagonistic one. I know you saw me, you weakling, the jackalope sneers. What? Don't have the stomach for the truth? You had the stomach to run away from your friend when he needed you. I climb to my feet, gritting my teeth at the pain. I glance around, meticulously avoiding the jackalope, looking for the road. There. It's off to my left, about twenty paces. So, that's how you're gonna play it? Pretend you can't see or hear me? This is your fault, you know. You voted for those fucking democratic pansy-ass do-gooders. If the elephants were in charge, they'd have dropped a few bombs and nipped this zombie bullshit in the bud. None of this apocalypse mumbo-jumbo would have happened. Then you wouldn't be here, and Frederico 
would still be alive. My hands tremble. From fatigue, from stress, from grief, from the appearance of the jackalope, who can say? I pick my way through the forest, paying close attention to the placement of my bad, swollen foot. My leg brushes a bush and comes away wet, soaked with dew. I pause, staring down at the bush. A minute passes. I unbuckle my hydration pack and drop it to the forest floor. Next, I pull off my stinky, sweat-stained, grimy T-shirt. I drag the shirt across the bush, trying to soak up the dew. Twigs and leaves snag on the material. Three days ago, that would have annoyed me. Today, I barely notice it. I repeat this process with the shirt on three more bushes, by which time the fabric is nice and wet in my hands. I shove the material into my mouth and suck, pulling the dew onto my tongue and down my throat. The nasty, salty tang of my sweat accompanies the dew, but I'm too exhausted and too thirsty to care. Way to go, survivor, says the jackalope. He applauds my efforts with his front paws, which somehow sound like human hands as they clap. Guess you've got some grit in you after all. Who would have thought? Once I suck my shirt dry, I move farther into the forest in search of more shrubs. I spend the next forty-five minutes soaking my shirt with dew and drinking. The jackalope keeps up a running commentary, alternating between insults and political tirades. Seriously, Kate, I want you to take a good look at our country. Ask yourself this. Wouldn't things be better if automatic assault rifles were legal? Wouldn't you like to have one of those suckers slung across your back right now? I bet my left nut you'd trade that stupid water pack for an automatic. Does my imaginary jackalope have nuts? I blink rapidly against the grit in my eyes, willing myself not to look at him. His reproductive organs are none of my business. Being able to function with little to no sleep is an art. It's a skill I've practiced and honed over the years. Every six weeks or so, I make it a point to stay awake for a 24-hour period. This keeps me primed for races that require me to be on my feet for 24 hours or more. It's a practice I put into place after the Badwater race through Death Valley, when I first encountered this fuzzy little asshole. I've never hallucinated since then. Until now. Maybe I should have been staying up for 48-hour increments. Maybe that would have helped stave off this hallucination. What's your big plan now, champ? the jackalope asks. No way you'll make it to Arcata with nothing but dew in your stomach. Something in me snaps. My careful wall of self-control crumbles around me. Shut the fuck up, I growl, turning my back on him. Shut up and leave. I stalk away. Or at least I try to stalk. I manage a huffy limp with my gimpy ankle. Hey, is that any way to treat an old friend? The jackalope hops after me. We're BFFs. Bad water friends forever. We are not friends. I pause, scanning my surroundings. I spot a solid branch and limp over to it. You are a figment of my batshit crazy mind. I'd like you to go away now. You gotta stop with this patchouli hippie bullshit, the jackalope replies. The human mind is not nearly as powerful as your kind thinks it is. With your yoga mats and organic food, you think you can just will me away with a Jedi mind trick? Think again, sister. I yank the branch out of the undergrowth, then set about stripping off the smaller twigs. I rip with more vigor than necessary, struggling against the urge to tell the jackalope that I've never set foot in a yoga studio. When I'm done stripping the branch, I'm left with a decent walking stick. Not quite as nice as a trekking pole, which I use on steeper races, but it'll do. I pick my way to the road, brushing off the last of the dirt and pine needles. I emerge onto the asphalt. Above me is a big sign that says, One Mile, World Famous One Log House. To my dismay, the jackalope hops out of the forest and lands beside me. God, you're rank, he tells me. 
I may need to find a new BFF if you don't do something about that smell. I pause, closing my eyes and taking a deep breath. The next fifty miles are going to be long. Chapter 50 Fatigue Factor There's an ultra-race phenomenon called fatigue factor. As I stand there on the deserted mountain road, feeling pain in every part of my body, I know I'm coming face to face with it. Fatigue factor can easily double a standard mile time. On fresh legs, I can knock out 50 miles in 10 to 12 hours, depending on the weather and the terrain, putting me in a range of 12 to 14 minute miles. A decent pace for a middle-of-the-pack runner. But I don't have fresh legs. I'm exhausted, hungry, thirsty, and injured. Feeling as shitty as I do, I estimate I'll be lucky to log three miles an hour. I'm also going to have to stop to forage for water and food, which will take even more time. If I get to Arcata in the next twenty-four hours, it'll be a miracle. More likely, it'll take longer. The idea of being on my feet another day or more almost brings me to tears. I dig deep, hunting within myself for every last scrap of resolve. What are you waiting for? The jackalope asks. Frederico didn't sacrifice himself so you could loaf around feeling sorry for yourself. Get your ass moving, chica. I set out at a brisk walk, pushing forward with my injured ankle. Honestly, the ankle is just one of many aches and pains. The walking stick helps a little, but not much. Suffer better, I mutter to myself. Suck it up and suffer better. Talking to yourself is the first sign of insanity, says the jackalope. The two-lane road is bordered by towering pine trees and redwoods. The air smells good, fresh and laden with the scent of pine. For this moment in time, surrounded by nothing except trees and empty road, I can pretend the world hasn't gone to complete shit. I continue on at a fast walk, trying to walk through my achy soreness. A mile later, I round a corner and find myself in Garberville, population 913. To my right is the one log house. It's an ancient redwood tree that's been turned on its side, hollowed out, and made into a tiny house. It was one of the silly stops Carter and I made on our trip to Arcata. We'd taken a few goofy pictures in front of the one log house. Clogging the highway is a jumble of deserted cars. Just past the house are a few gift shops catering to tourists. On the opposite side of the road is a gas station and a campground. On the ground near the gas pumps is a pile of bodies. My heart stops at the sight of them. I scurry off the road and take cover in the trees. Nothing happens. I peer out cautiously from between the cover of two redwoods. The bodies upon closer inspection, are zombies, each with its head smashed in. Besides the pile of zombies, there are no other signs of the undead. There are none milling around the cars and stumbling out of the campground. There are none clawing at the windows of the tourist shops or bumping into the gas station pumps. Someone has rounded up the zombies and made this neat stack of bodies. Someone has cleaned up this tiny little town in the mountains. Who? I bet whoever did this voted for the elephants, the jackalope says. No way they cleaned up this many zombies without some heat. You should try to get your hands on a gun. I consider my options, chewing my lip in thought. I really need food and water. It's a good bet I can get both in one of the shops. Then again, it's a good bet I will run into whoever made that pile of zombie bodies. After a moment's thought, I decide food can wait. It's just not worth the risk. Water, on the other hand, is essential. My dewdrops repast won't hold me much longer. 
I'll avoid the shops and find a hose or faucet instead. The back of the stores seems like a good place to start. With any luck, I'll find a hose and get out before anyone notices me. You're not exactly at the top of your game, the jackalope says. You sure you want to risk this? Fuck! I close my eyes, wrestling with my temper. Screaming at my imaginary friend is a sure way to draw attention. Forget the water. Your ass needs a gun. The furry asshole has a point. Although if I did have a weapon, I'd probably blow my own foot off. I pick my way through the trees, circling behind the back of the one log house and gift shops. Finding a tree with some low-hanging branches for concealment, I spend fifteen minutes monitoring them. There are several cars parked behind the buildings, but no sign of people or zombies. The cars conceal most of the building, but I figure I have a good chance of finding a hose or water spigot there. Find water, fill my pack, and get back on the road. That's my plan. I will not, as my jackalope keeps insisting, go in search of a gun. He's on his hind legs, shoving paws into my chest to emphasize each word as he speaks. Will you shut up? I hiss at him. I'm trying to concentrate. Besides, my railroad spikes and screwdrivers have gotten me this far. The jackalope tisks. The gun, he sneers, is for you. It takes a moment for his meaning to sink in. My hallucination just told me to kill myself. I squeeze my eyes shut. I'm losing it. Seriously, what do you want to go on? He asks. What do you have to live for? You lost Kyle and Frederico. Carter is probably dead, too. Why put yourself through more hell just to have your heart broken one more time? I clap my hands over my ears, trying to block out the jackalope. My pulse ramps up, my heart pounds in my chest. I feel the world unraveling around me. God, how I wish Frederico was here. How I wish Kyle was here. Seriously, just get it over with, the jackalope says. Let us both get some much-deserved rest. I dig nails into my scalp nodding fingers in my hair. I can't quit. I can't. Carter is still out there. Alive. Kyle and Frederico would want me to keep going. No, I whisper. I can't give up. I won't give up. Did you say something? The jackalope asks. Or were you just sniveling in self-pity? Fuck this little asshole. I lash out with my good foot. The tiny furred body flies through the trees and disappears. I stand there, panting and tense, waiting for the jackalope to return. My heart continues to hammer in my chest. Two minutes go by. Five. Ten. My heart rate slowly returns to normal. The forest around me is quiet. Nothing moves. The jackalope doesn't come back. If I'd known it was that easy to get rid of him, I'd have drop-kicked him sooner. Good riddance, I mutter. I turn my attention back to the shops. Nothing has changed. Everything is quiet and still. I creep forward, making my way toward the buildings. I pull out a screwdriver I pilfered from a toolbox behind the bar in Rod's roadhouse. It helps fortify my nerves. I reach the first of the cars, a beat-up Dodge Caravan, and crouch behind it. Lowering my head, I scan the ground under the car and beyond. Specifically, I'm looking for feet, for any sign of another human or zombie. At the sight of either, I'm out of here. What's more terrifying, the living or the dead? The dead may have wanted to eat me alive, but they haven't thought of raping me. They didn't murder an innocent animal for shits and giggles, or put a bell collar on me and set a horde of zombies loose. There's no sign of anyone, only the rough gravel road and bits of litter, 
a crumpled beer can, a black trash bag overrun with ants, and discarded cigarette butts. I ease around the car, moving closer to the building. There, a spigot, right next to a battered screen door. I pull off my pack and open the water bladder inside. I quickly scan the area one more time, then dash forward. I turn the spigot. Water hisses loudly in the pipes, then gushes forth in a cool stream. I'm so busy watching the door and scanning the parked cars that I end up drenching half my pack before getting the bladder in place. Inside the building, something creaks. I stumble back from the water valve just as the screen door opens. There's an instant where my eyes meet those of a thirty-something man with blonde hair and a goatee. He's mostly clean, with only a little bit of blood splattered on his plain green T-shirt. At the sight of him, I scramble away. Hey! He calls, stretching a hand out in my direction. He looks like a high school basketball coach. He also looks twice my size and strength. Panic rises in me. I turn and bolt. If you're enjoying this series, be sure to check out Jesus Christ Zombie Killer. This series takes freakishly fast zombies, like you would find in the movie World War Z, and pits them against classic biblical heroes such as John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, and Jesus. Available on Amazon, Kindle Unlimited, and select audiobook retailers. And now, back to the show. Chapter 51 Batshit Crazy I crash through the trees, sloshing water all over me. Wait, the man calls. I won't hurt you. Fuck that. Pausing only to seal my water bag, I sling my pack around my shoulders and haul ass. I make a ton of racket, but I'm more concerned with speed than stealth, betting on my ability to outrun the stranger. I use the walking stick to knock branches out of my path. I may be beat to shit and I may be dodging through the woods like a feral Ewok, but I've logged more time running through trees than most normal people. I can lose this bastard, even with my fucked-up ankle. Come back! The man's shout echoes through the trees, sending another spike of panic through me. We won't hurt you! We can help! We. Fuck. He's got friends. A waking nightmare blazes through my brain, and I briefly imagine the basketball coach and his buddies gang-raping me in the one-log house. Panic grips my throat, making it hard to breathe. Breath hisses in and out of my mouth. Lady, please! We won't hurt you! The stranger's shouts are like whips at my ankles. All it does is drive me harder. I trip on a root and catch myself on a tree. The impact jars my arm, but I push off and keep going. My ankle screams as I half-slide, half-run down a small hill. I mentally tell it to shut the hell up. I scramble up a ravine, whip through the trees, and at last slide to a halt behind a large boulder. I crumple to the ground, breathing hard and pressing my back against a mossy stone. I huddle there, hands and arms trembling. It occurs to me that I'm close to cracking. My sanity is held together by spider threads. One stiff breeze, and I'll unravel. It also occurs to me that my fear is possibly unfounded and irrational. Basketball coach might be a nice person. The taint spoiling our world might not yet have touched him. I could be misjudging the situation, but I don't care. No way I'll let that man or his friends get close to me. I don't care if they're the reincarnation of Mother Teresa. I take a deep gulp of water, listening for signs of pursuit. The trees are quiet. There are voices in the distance, the basketball coaches we, no doubt, but nothing immediate moves in the forest around me. Until the jackalope hops out of the underbrush. His fur is rumpled, leaves and twigs are lodged in his antlers. He gives me a narrow-eyed glare and hops closer. Just remember, he says, what you do to me, you really do to yourself. I look away from him, my delicate spider web of sanity shivering dangerously. I summon a memory of Kyle. You're batshit crazy, babe, but that's why I love you. 
I hear his voice in my head and see his lopsided loving smile. I love you too, babe, I whisper. Talking to yourself now? The jackalope asks. Yeah, I'm losing it. But I don't really give a shit. I push myself to my feet. I'm going to finish what I set out to do, or die trying. I owe that to Frederico. He gave his life so I could get to Arcata in one piece. I expect the jackalope to sneer at me, but instead he says, That a girl. Dig deep, sister. I power hike south through the forest, angling in the direction of where I think the road is. Two miles later I find it. Through the thinning trees I see another tourist trap selling larger-than-life wood carvings. The sign above the shop reads, The Legend of Bigfoot, in big, bold letters. Outside are carvings of Bigfoot, forest animals, and cartoon characters. There are two men wrestling a giant wood carving of a dwarf across the parking lot, hauling it toward the shop. Nearby is another pile of zombie bodies. I continue south in the trees avoiding the shop. They could be nice, the jackalope says. I bet they have food. No fucking way, I whisper, and continue on. Half a mile later, I emerge onto the road. All the walking has helped combat some of the stiffness. My body still hurts like hell, but that's to be expected. I toss the walking stick aside and break into a jog. Mile 151. I reach the small hamlet of Benbow. The highway runs on a ridge perched above the town. To the right is a KOA. To the left is a Tudor-like chalet perched on the edge of the freeway. I see evidence of the outbreak. A large fire burns in the KOA, enveloping several of the burning buildings. A car is overturned on the off-ramp. Half of the Tudor-like hotel has also burned. The north side collapsed in its own smoldering ash. A six-car pile-up lies in the middle of the highway before me. Three zombies shuffle aimlessly on the asphalt. I slow to a walk, trying to make as little sound as possible. I pull out my screwdriver and a railroad spike, holding one in each hand. Making a wide arc, I steer around the car wreck. One of the zombies, a teenage girl in jeans and a tank top, pauses in her shuffling, cocking her head in my direction. I freeze. The zombie girl and I stand in suspension, me stock still on the side of the road, her with her head tilted toward me as she listens. Just when I think she's going to turn away, she moans and takes a step in my direction. My stomach knots. I have to do something. I won't survive another run like last night. The jackalope sits unconcerned at my feet, grooming his hind leg, little fucker. With a silent scream, I charge the zombie girl. She has only seconds to register my attack. Her lips peel back in a snarl, and she takes two more steps toward me, arms reaching. I sidestep her fumbling hands and ram a spike through her eye. The two remaining zombies converge on me. One is a man in tight wranglers and a cowboy hat. The other, a teenage boy in an Abercrombie and Fitch t-shirt. I sprint away from them and scramble onto the hood of a Honda Civic, putting myself momentarily out of reach. I crouch on the hood, calculating my next move. Both zombies flail at the front of the car, moaning and stretching their hands toward me. I need to split them up, divide and conquer. Out of the corner of my eye, I spy the jackalope. He's holding a video camera. A fucking old-school VHS recorder. The red light blinks at me, confirming my suspicion that he's filming my exploits. He gives me a thumbs up, which is odd, considering rabbits don't normally have thumbs. You got this, sister, he calls. I clamber onto the roof of the car purposely making noise. I hope they'll split up, each coming at me from a different side. Then I can fight them separately. No such luck. They both circle to the left, bumping into each other and growling. Damn it. Plan B. 
I swing my good foot and kick the cowboy in the face. He staggers back with a growl. I take the opening and dive across the roof of the car, grabbing the teenage zombie by the collar of the shirt. I haul him forward and stab him through the eye. Cowboy zombie recovers and makes a swipe at me. I cry out involuntarily. He grabs my arm, jerking it toward his mouth. Using his grip on me as leverage, I jerk my torso around and deliver another brutal kick, this time with my bad foot. Pain lances up my leg, but I ignore it. The zombie momentarily loosens his grip. I jerk free. Then I leap off the car like I'm a James Bond stunt double, knocking into the cowboy zombie. I grunt at the impact, landing heavily atop the undead monster. His hat goes flying. My elbow scrapes against the asphalt. He reaches for me, but I'm quicker. I bring the spike down. Hard. The fucking zombie moves. I miss his eye, connecting with the concrete instead. A shot goes up my arm from the impact. Undead fucker! I snarl. I slam my other hand into his forehead, holding him in place. He claws at my arms, drooling. My spike comes down again, once, twice, three times then several more times for good measure, until red mush is all that's left of the cowboy zombie's face. That's for Frederico, you undead fuck. I get shakily to my feet. My hands are smeared with blood. I wipe them as best I can on the cowboy's wranglers. Bravo! The jackalow pops into view, still wielding his video camera. You're gonna be famous on YouTube, he crows. The title of your video will be Crazed Runner Takes Down Undead Cowboy. Grimacing in disgust, I turn my back on him. Chapter 52 Death Run I make a quick scan of the vehicles. There are zombies in four of them clawing and salivating on the windows. The other two are empty, one of them with the passenger door hanging open. Gonna try your luck with another car? the jackalope asks. No, I'm done with cars. I'm also past caring about the fact I'm having a conversation with an imaginary nemesis. I rifle through the first car and hit the jackpot. The trunk is full of camping supplies. Among the sleeping bags, cooking gear, and tarps, is an ice chest full of food. Next to the ice chest are several grocery bags crammed full of dry goods. Stomach rumbling, I reach greedily into the bag, grabbing the first thing I touch. It turns out to be a box of Hostess cupcakes. I flash back to the last meal I shared with Frederico on the side of the road, after we cleared that RV of zombies. I see him shoving his face full of Hostess cupcakes, as he talked about his failed attempts to connect with his daughter. I was a shitty father, Kate. I hear him say. Still am. I burst into tears. They come streaming out of my eyes, pouring down my cheeks and dripping off the tip of my chin. My chest heaves and my nose clogs up with snot. I slump down to the ground, hugging the box of cupcakes to my chest. Frederico should be here. He should be here to eat these with me. God, I miss him. I miss him so much. I want to see his wild curly gray hair and the gentle crow's feet around his eyes when he smiles. I want to hear him call me Jackalope. Frederico! I scream his name silently. Tears dampen the cupcake box. It's your fault. The jackalope says calmly, coming to sit beside me. The fucking video camera hangs around his neck. You should have stayed home. You never should have left Healdsburg. His words pierce me like venom. I push violently away from him and return to the car. A bit more rifling reveals a plastic two-gallon water jug. With slightly trembling hands, I yank it free. I take a long drink, then fill my pack. You never should have left Healdsburg, the jackalope repeats. Instead, you dragged Frederico out here on this death run. Death run. That's a good name. I'm on a fucking death run. I stare at the array of food before me, 
trying to figure out what to do. I've completely lost my appetite, but I know I need to eat. Hell, does it even matter what I eat? No. No, it doesn't matter. I just need fuel in whatever form it comes in. I seize the closest bag of groceries and yank on the cloth handle, tucking the cupcakes in on top. You brought Frederico out here on this run because you're broken, says the jackalope. You're broken, and you think running is the only thing that'll put your insides back together. His words fly into me like darts, wounding me in places I didn't know existed. I shrink from him, momentarily curling my body around the grocery bag. As if that will protect me. No, I whisper. That's not why I run. Liar. The word cracks across me with the sting of a barbed whip. I turn away and break into a run, fleeing from the jackalope. I hug the groceries close to me, clinging to them like they're my last lifeline. That's right, the jackalope calls after me. Run, Kate, run. That's all you know how to do. Mile 151 I leave Benbow at a fast clip, trying to lose the jackalope. His words drive me forward. Run, Kate, run. That's all you know how to do. My breath burns in my throat. The grocery bag jiggles and bounces in my arms. My body is a solid block of pain. Mile 152 I've given up trying to lose the jackalope. I'm too tired. Too beaten down. I polished off the hostess cupcakes and currently work my way through a bag of barbecue chips, shoveling the salty wafers into my mouth. I eat as I move, committed to a fast walk. It's the best I can manage while simultaneously eating and wrestling with a shopping bag. The jackalope trails me, keeping ten feet between us. That's right, Kate, he jeers. Keep running. Doesn't matter how fast you go, I'll always be here. He lets loose a creepy laugh that would do justice to any horror movie. Mile 155 Even now, with all the pain and physical discomfort I'm shouldering, I can honestly say I still love running. To be honest, pain is part of what I love. Why is that? It's a complicated facet of my obsession for this strange sport. When I first started to run, it was to escape the maze of my relationship with Kyle. The maze was our own making, and the physical stress of running was a distraction to the larger pain I faced at home. To be honest, I had never truly forgiven myself for running away from Kyle all those years ago. Mile 158 I shovel uncooked pasta shells into my mouth, crunching them as I jog. Vaguely, I wonder what they'll feel like if I throw them up later. I've thrown up lots of things on ultra runs, but never uncooked pasta. Will they cook in my stomach? Soften in the stomach acid? In front of me is a sign that reads, Avenue of the Giants. The Avenue of the Giants is a 31-mile stretch of highway that winds through towering ancient redwood trees. I veer right, unconsciously heading for the exit. It's not until I'm a mile down the road that I realize I've left Highway 101. I pause, glancing at the redwoods looming up on either side of me. It's hard to grasp the enormity of the giant trees without seeing them in person. They're living high-rises, remnants of a world that no longer exists. It's hard not to feel insignificant and full of awe, even in the midst of a zombie apocalypse. Carter and I drove this road together. Is this why I came this way? In the quiet solitude of the ancient trees, I can almost imagine zombies don't exist, that Frederico and Kyle are still alive, that the world is still right side up. Keep dreaming, sister. The jackalope hops up and sits at my feet. The world is fucked up and so are you. Shut up. 
appending the half-full box of pasta shells I dumped them on his head. No one asked you. The jackalope scowls at me, swatting irritably at the pasta. Face it, Kate, running is the only thing you're good at. Mile 161 I haven't always run away from things. As Kyle and I worked through our issues, I found myself running toward him, toward us. Every time I finished a tough race and crossed a finish line, I found proof of inner grit and strength. I found a woman worthy of Kyle's love, a person who didn't quit when things got hard and painful. I like that woman. Mile 163 I'm down to the bottom of my grocery bag. All that's left is a six-pack of Sprite. Seeing it makes me think of Frederico. I've never been a fan of soda, but he always took some to ultra races, often downing a can at every aid station. Slowing to a stop, I drop the grocery bag and pull out a can. I glance at the jackalope. For Frederico, I say softly, and crack open the can and take a long drink. For Frederico, the jackalope echoes. I'm grateful when he doesn't make a caustic remark. The carbonation fills my throat with an uncomfortable pressure. I ignore it and continue to drink. Too bad you killed him. Something in me snaps. The soda falls from my hand and splats on the ground. I spin around and seize the jackalope by the horns. He lets loose with a very human-like yell. Face twisting in a violent rictus, I tear off his antlers and fling them into the woods. Blood oozes from the sockets. His yell turns into a scream. I pick up his furry body and hurl him into the forest, a crazed hiss passing between my teeth. He collides with a tree and falls out of sight, rattling through the bushes as he thumps to the ground. My chest heaves. I clench my fists and stare into the trees, waiting for him to return. One minute ticks by. Two. Three. Five. Ten. No sign of him. No movement from the trees. I'm alone on this desolate road. At least for now. I know the jackalope will be back. He always comes back. I sag, an anguished sob racking me. Frederico! I scream his name silently in my mind. It's my fault he's dead. He died because he cared more about me than he cared about himself. It doesn't matter if I didn't ask for the sacrifice. It doesn't matter that I don't feel worthy of the sacrifice. The simple fact is that he died so I could live. This knowledge settles around my shoulders with an unwelcome weight. I want Frederico's death to mean something. I want to make him proud. I want to make Kyle proud. Hell, I want to make myself proud. Will I ever be able to do that? Swallowing back my tears, I pull out another can of soda. I silently say goodbye to my friend with each gulp. Chapter 53 Avenue of the Giants I leave the empty grocery bag and the rest of the sodas on the side of the road and start to run. It's impossible to suppress the mega burps that result after the pounding of the sprite. Worried I might alert every zombie in a ten mile radius, I muffle them against my arm. The enormous redwood trees line the two lane country road. On encountering a few abandoned cars, I head into the woods and creep past them. Mile 164. My legs are numb. When did that happen? This is another sign that I've been running for a really, really, really long time. The body, pushed past the brink of exhaustion, 
diverts energy to the core. Non-essential extremities, like arms and legs, go numb as a result. Corporal therapy. That's what running is to me. Some days, I may as well be flogging myself. Mile 165. Miranda. It's a hamlet with a population of 520. If you blink, you might just miss it. There's a post office, a few restaurants, a motel, and a smattering of mobile homes. Carter and I stopped in a cute cafe here and had burgers. I decide to avoid Miranda. I cut into the forest, slowing to a walk so I won't make too much noise. It takes a solid hour to make my way back to the road on the north side of town, but I get there without any confrontations. I spot a few zombies, but manage to creep past them without drawing attention. Mile 171 It's not fair to boil running down into a form of corporal therapy. Yes, there's a twisted embracing of pain, but there have been countless times I ran for the simple love of the sport. Escape, therapy, joy, running is all these things. How can one simple act have so many facets and such deep meaning in my life? The person I am is inextricably enmeshed with a verb. Mile 174 Did Kyle die so I could save Carter? The question crashes into my head, reverberating with the force of a gong. I come to a dead stop on the highway, rocked to my core by this thought. Ever since Kyle died, I've run to manage my anguish. Before that, I logged fifty to seventy-five miles a week. After he died, my mileage crept up. Eighty-five miles a week, ninety-five, one hundred five, up and up, until I found myself logging a minimum of one hundred twenty miles every week. Never have I been in such incredible shape. If Kyle hadn't died, I wouldn't be in a position to make this two hundred mile run to Arcata. My husband believed things happened for a reason, even shitty things. Sometimes it took years to understand the lesson behind shitty events, but he maintained there was a reason. He was always more spiritual than I was. Have these last two years of hell on earth been in preparation for... for this? The revelation breaks over me like a golden wave. It brings me a tiny bit of peace. Mile 176 I run to myself. That's the simplest distillation of my obsession with long-distance running. Somewhere, in all the countless miles, I find myself. Every time I lace up my shoes and roll out the front door, I connect with myself. Through pain and joy, I find me. Mile 179 The road is silent and beautiful. The redwood giants the only witnesses to my solitary passage. I jog into Pioneer Grove, a stand of the beautiful giant trees on the northern end of the avenue. Some of the trees are as much as eight to ten feet in diameter. The grove is deserted. No zombies. No death. Just beauty and life. A tree stump about twenty feet wide stands before me. It was cut down in the heyday of the logging industry. Every inch of the stump is covered with carvings. I run my fingers over the carvings, searching, searching, searching. There, facing away from the road, about five feet up, a carving. R. Carving. What are you doing, sweetie? I held a long twig in my hand, snapping off little pieces as I wandered through the redwood grove toward Carter. My son was dressed in loose jeans and a plain blue t-shirt. A ball cap sat atop his shaggy hair, 
the ends of which curled around his cheeks. He'd trimmed his beard recently, though it was still full and bushy. In Carter's hand was a pocket knife, a high school graduation gift from Federico. He glanced up at me from a heart he'd carved on the tree trunk. His eyes were unfocused, distant. I could tell he heard me speak, but he hadn't heard my question. Hey, Mom, he said vaguely, returning his attention to his carving. Coming to stand beside him, I gave his shoulder a squeeze as I watched him work in silence. With infinite care, Carter carved the letters K, K, and C inside the heart. Kyle, Kate, and Carter. My chest tightened. He leaned forward, blowing away the loose shavings, then spent a few more minutes smoothing out the letters. When he finished, he looked at me. His eyes were wet, but his cheeks were dry. We're together, Mom. Carter said. Doesn't matter where we are, you, me, and Dad, we're always together. It took all my willpower not to burst into tears. I dragged the trip out, doing everything I could to delay Carter's inevitable drop-off at college. He knew it, but he never complained. I sniffed and nodded, running my fingers over the letters my son had carved with such love. This was my fate to drop off my son and drive home to an empty house. I couldn't let him see how much it terrified me. He shouldn't have to take care of his mother. Thanks, sweetie. I gave him a hug, trying not to clutch him. Dad loved the Redwoods, you know. I know. Carter flashed me a quick smile. He would like it, the three of us here together. His fingers caressed the carving. Yeah. He would. I turned away, willing away my tears. I forced my voice into a cheerful tone. Come on. We should get going if we want to make it to campus before dark. Now, two years later, I find Carter's carving in Pioneer Grove. I run my hand over the heart and letters. The carving has faded and blended in with the dozens of other initials in the wood beside it. I pick up a small rock and press it against the stump. I chip away at the bark, carving a rough F next to my family heart. I take my time, wanting it to look nice. When I finish, I stand back to admire my crude handiwork. Then I close my eyes and imagine they are all here with me. Kyle, Carter, and Frederico. I can almost smell Kyle's soap and see Carter's bushy beard in the corner of my eye. I hear Frederico say, Get moving, Jackalope. I let myself pretend, if only for ten seconds, that we're together, that I am with the three people who matter most to me. It feels good to pretend. Here, in the avenue of ancient giants, a sense of peace washes over me. Something rustles in the grove. I open my eyes and see the jackalope. He hops resolutely toward me, ears wilted. The blood on his head has dried to dark lumps. A new set of antlers has already begun to sprout. They are two pale nubs on his forehead. Five feet away from me, he draws to a halt. We stand there, staring at each other in silence. The weight of my life hangs between us. Everything I am, everything I'm not, it's all there. It's so heavy it could crack open the earth. But it doesn't. The earth remains solid beneath my feet. I know what I have to do. I swallow and take a step forward. The jackalope tenses, ears swiveling toward me in alarm. I pause, keeping my arms at my side so he can see I mean him no harm. The jackalope's ears relax, his nose twitches. I take two more steps, closing the distance between us. Slowly, 
gingerly, I stoop down and lift him into my arms. He tenses. I cuddle him, pressing my nose into his dirty, bloody fur. After a moment, he relaxes and nuzzles my chest. We don't speak. We don't move. We just stand there, wrapped in the silence of the redwoods. And then the jackalope disappears, vanishing from my arms and dissolving into a puff of mist. Chapter 54 Arcada The jackalope does not return. I am a lone runner on the road, slowly and steadily making my way north. The highway climbs, steadily rising with the mountains. I fall into a pattern. I stick to the asphalt as much as possible, only veering into the woods when I see zombies or wrecked cars on the road. Mile 201 Where the fuck is Arcata? Where the hell is that fucking town? 201.3 miles. That's how far Frederico said it was from Geyserville to Humboldt University. Here I am, at mile 201, and there is no fucking college campus anywhere in sight. For that matter, there isn't anything in sight. Just trees and mountains and the goddamn Eel River. Fuck. 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 Who knows how many miles we added to our run on the various side trips we took. I could have another fifteen miles to go. Or fifty. I don't even know where I am. The thought makes me mad. Really mad. I glare at the world at large, my stride never faltering. Fuck you, world, I say. I'm finishing this. Just try to stop me. Mile 205. Damn it. I need more water. I veer off the road, jogging down a slope to the Eel River. Ignoring the fact that I'll likely manifest symptoms of dysentery, giardia, or schistosomiasis in the next day or two, I fill my pack up with river water. As I fasten the pack back into place, I see it. A dull glint off to my right, on top of a small rise. I squint, peering up the slope. Could that be a railroad track? I scramble up the hill. Sure enough, there in front of me are the crooked, rusty tracks of an abandoned railroad. I stare at it dumbly. I recall bending over the map with Federico and noting the point when the railroad gave up following Highway 101 and veered east to end in some faraway town. We never looked to see if there were other tracks. It makes sense that there would be, though. Logging was once the lifeblood of Northern California. Trains would have been used to haul the lumber. I weigh my options. Sticking with the road has a lot of risks, especially considering some of the larger towns in front of me, Scotia, Fortuna, and Eureka. There's a good chance they'll be overrun with zombies. Following the tracks has its own set of risks. It will be much harder to forage for food. Water, too, if the tracks veer from the river for long batches of time and the tracks are a bitch to navigate. But they are safer. I deliberate for a long minute. Road or rails? Rails or road? Fuck it, I mutter. I'd rather face starvation, dehydration, and injury. Setting my jaw, I step onto the tracks. They're as brutal as I remember them. Uneven, clogged with foxtails and stickers and weeds as tall as I am. And here, farther north, are vicious blackberry briars. It's too early in the season for there to be fruit, which makes the bushes both annoying and useless. Even without my injured ankle, it is a race from hell. I run when I can, but most times I am forced to move at a brisk hike. The miles blur. I focus on the monumental task of putting one foot in front of the other. 
The tracks roughly follow the Eel River, giving me plenty of water to drink. I pass the occasional house or trailer home on my trek. There are times when the tracks draw close to the road, bringing me near cars. I forage for food when I need to, killing zombies when I can't avoid it. My feet are bricks of pain. The swollen ankle is just one of the many aches. My injured knee has also swelled up. An old injury has resurfaced on my right foot. It feels like someone is ramming an ice pick into the top of it, right at the base of my toes. Blisters on the toes push against my socks and shoes. There are other blisters on the top and bottom of my feet. I wish I had the energy to stop and tend to them, but I don't. I'm pretty sure I'll have no toenails left by the end of this trip. Fuck it. They'll grow back eventually. My arms are leaden weights at my sides. Achy soreness crawls along my back, neck, and abdominals. There's chafing along my inner thighs, under my sports bra, and along my shoulders and armpits. The poison oak has spread up both arms. A few patches have also popped up on my neck and cheek, too. In an effort to combat the itchiness, I've slathered mud on the rashes. I look like a crazed golem. My bullet wound throbs and aches. I embrace that particular pain. It's a reminder of a time when I still had Frederico by my side. The sun sets and rises. Still, I run. Sometimes I cry, for long stretches of time. Occasionally I laugh madly at nothing in particular. Mostly, I keep my head down and slog forward. Do I stop to sleep? I wish I knew. Mile 229 Arcata Population 17,697 After 78 hours and 47 minutes, I have arrived. The railroad tracks have, at long last, delivered me to my destination. I'm filthy, in pain, hungry, thirsty, bloody, and covered in mud. But I'm here. I'm here, and I'm alive. A dark cloud of smoke sits on top of the town. Ash flicks fill the air. Somewhere a fire burns. A big fire. I half limp, half jog into this strange town of hippies, artists, druggies, anarchists, and college students. Most of the buildings and homes are colorful and ornate relics of the once-booming logging industry. The tracks have taken me into the west side of town. The college is, of course, on the opposite side, but that seems like a small obstacle in light of everything. I easily navigate the streets of Arcata, having run through most of them whenever I visited Carter. A hush has fallen over the college town. It's a hush of necessity a hush adopted by prey. I move at a walk, partially because running is too much of an effort, partially because I don't want to make noise. The zombies moan and wander the streets in blind packs, their numbers thicken toward the center of town. I steer clear of them, a few times hunkering down and hiding until they pass. I find remnants of military presence. There are two hummers near the town square, one of them is half buried in a storefront, the other lies on its side. I count eight zombie soldiers, all of them bloody and ghastly. There are dead bodies, real dead bodies, in the street, all of them partially or mostly eaten. Some houses have clearly been vandalized, shattered windows, busted doors, driveways, and streets strewn with discarded loot. Other homes and shops have been boarded up. In a second-story window of a blue house, a pair of eyes watch me as I pass. When I meet the person's gaze, the blinds immediately snap shut. This is a cowed, dead town. Mile 230 Finish Line Humboldt State University it's in ruins. 
I stand at the entrance to the university staring at the remains of the once beautiful white stucco student apartments. These had been new buildings, built to attract more students. Most have burned to the ground. There isn't a living human in sight. A giant football field nestles in the crux of the apartments. Dozens of zombies mill around the field, many in military uniforms. Students and faculty are among them. Wrecked and burned military jeeps dot the landscape. My worst fears dance before my eyes. I crouch behind the broad stucco sign bearing the university's name, taking a moment to steady myself. Keep it together, I tell myself. You're almost to the finish line. Luckily, there are four lanes of traffic and a wrought iron fence between me and the zombies. I veer to the far margin and creep past the fence. I break into a run when there's a pile of rubble between me and the undead, following the road that runs along the perimeter of the campus. Strangely alert and awake, I scan the surroundings for signs of danger, my screwdriver and railroad spike in hand. I head toward the dorms where my son lives, hoping the Creekside Lounge is still standing and not a pile of rubble, hoping Carter is still safe and alive. How long has it been since I spoke to him from the old phone in Rod's Roadhouse? One day, I think, though my sense of time has been completely blurred. A scattering of bodies lies in the road ahead of me. Most look to have been students, but there are a few soldiers in their midst. There are chunks of torn flesh everywhere, strewn body parts, and way too much blood. They look like they were killed by some sort of explosion. God! What happened in this place? I approach cautiously, wondering if any have turned into zombies. But in the growing morning light, none of them move. They're all dead. Really dead. I continue on. The road is quiet. In the air is a mixed scent of rot, blood, smoke, and pine. I pass other dead bodies, as well as a dozen or so abandoned cars that show evidence of violence, smashed windows, smears of blood, and occasionally a living zombie trapped inside. There are no signs of living humans anywhere. The fire appears to have been focused in the front part of campus. Buildings farther north are untouched by flames, though they bear other scars of conflict. One looks like it was hit by a grenade or rocket launcher, Half its roof and western wall are gone, reduced to piles of debris. Other buildings are riddled with bullet holes. There are bodies and blood everywhere. So many dead kids it makes my heart ache. I at last arrive at Granite Avenue, the road leading up to the Creekview dorms where Carter lives. I power hike as the road angles uphill. Tall redwoods crowd the side of the asphalt. There are over a dozen different dorm buildings along Granite Avenue. They're reddish-brown, three-story buildings with dark green window trim tucked into the trees and ferns. My breath catches as I draw abreast of the first dorm. Dozens of bodies are scattered in the parking lot and along the road, all of them riddled with bullet holes. Some of the bodies look like they've been crushed by something large and heavy, like a car. Flies mass above the bodies in thick swarms. Carrion birds have already begun their work, pecking at eyes and open wounds on the bodies. Besides the flies and the birds, nothing moves. If there are zombies out there, I don't see them. The dorm buildings bear similar signs of abuse, pock marked with bullet holes and broken windows. There are dead kids on the steps. I double over and gag throwing up the little bit of food in my stomach. Tears blur my eyes. These kids have been massacred, I have no doubt. There may have been zombies among them, but most look to have been alive when they were killed. What the hell happened here? Had they been mowed down by a military force? I recall Carter saying something about the military showing up with hummers, guns, and weapons. He'd mentioned a lot of panic. Is this what he'd meant by panic? Had that panic been this massacre? God, 
Carter is so much like his dad sometimes. Details are not their strong points. I grit my teeth, put my head down, and keep moving. The road is littered with bodies, kids, all of them in their late teens or early twenties. There are soldiers among the dead, but only a few. Farther up Granite Avenue I spot movement among the bodies. One is a girl with short red hair. Both her legs have been crushed, pulverized into mashed red stumps. She has dragged herself into a cluster of bodies where she feeds on the arm of a boy with bloody dreadlocks. If she hears my approach, she's so busy eating that she ignores me. The second is a boy with shaggy black hair. The right half of his body has been shredded by bullets, but both of his legs appear to be in working order. Lucky for me, he's feasting on the body of a chubby girl. He briefly raises white eyes in my direction, then returns his attention to his meal. It's an all-you-can-eat zombie buffet out here. Apparently, if a zombie is feeding, it doesn't care about other, more alive game. I file away this bit of info for later. I pick my way carefully through the bodies on the road, carefully watching for any stirring that would indicate a zombie instead of a normal corpse. The body of a girl twitches as I approach. She peels her bloody head up from the pavement, a low growl issuing at my approach. Something large rolled over her torso, crushing her from the shoulders down. I bury my screwdriver in her head, putting the poor girl out of her misery. My heart aches. The Creekview dorms are at the very end of Granite Avenue. I'm forced to put down two more zombies, both with ruined bodies that have rendered them immobile, before at last reaching them. Crouched among the redwoods are the three-story dorms where my son lives. Like all the others I've passed, these dorms have black pockmarks from gunfire. A wide oval parking lot sits at the base of the dorms. Like the other parking lots I've seen, this one is strewn with bodies. But there's something different here a sight that makes my heart swell with hope. Moving amongst the dead are four living kids. They're covered in grime, soot, and blood, but they are most definitely alive. Chapter 55 Finisher The kids don't notice me at first. They're moving amongst the bodies, dragging them one by one into a gazebo on the far side of the parking lot. So far, they've managed to clean up two-thirds of it, which tells me they've been at it for quite a while. I count three boys and one girl. They wear jeans, hiking boots, and have wooden chair legs slung through belt loops at their waists. The chair legs have been sharpened to points and are all stained with brown-red blood smears. My heart thumps erratically at the sight of the spears. Carter had said he and his friends were turning chair legs into spears. I want to call out to the kids but resist, not wanting to spook them or inadvertently draw the attention of a zombie. The boys have the shaggy Humboldt look about them. One has hair well past his shoulders and wears a shirt with the silhouette of Bob Marley on the front. Another dark-skinned boy in a tie-dyed T-shirt has a spectacular afro that sticks out a good eight inches from his head. The third boy sports a T-shirt with a big marijuana leaf on it and has sideburns to rival those on Wolverine. The girl wears her light brown hair in two braids, which she's fashioned into buns on either side of her head like Princess Leia. She wears a tight tank top covered with tiny skeleton heads. It's the girl who spots me first as I move into the parking lot. She calls out a warning to her friends and draws her chair leg spear, lifting it into a defensive position. The boys respond immediately, all of them drawing their spears. They don't shout or call out. They've obviously learned not to make noise, but instead warily watch me approach. I hold up my hands to show I mean no harm, making my way toward them. The students exchange glances and whispers, watching me all the while. I stop twenty feet away from them. Pitching my voice just loud enough to carry, I say, My name is Kate. I'm looking for a student named Carter Stevenson. 
Do any of you know him? The girl's eyes widen in surprise. Her lips part as if to respond. A scream cuts off whatever she's about to say. An Asian girl comes sprinting out of a nearby building. There were two in the janitor's closet, she shrieks. As if on cue, two zombies roll out of the building after her. They move at a good clip, their bodies barely decomposed. Shit, says one of the boys. Can't she learn to keep her mouth shut? The four of them move toward the girl, wooden spears raised. I run into their midst, brandishing my screwdriver and railroad spike. They glance at me, then apparently decide to let me join their posse. The scared girl dodges between two cars. The pursuing zombies smack into one car, hitting so hard they bounce off and sprawl onto their backs. The five of us form a semicircle around them. The first girl, the one not screaming like a sissy, lunges in, swinging her spear sharply toward the skull of the nearest zombie. The beast snarls, sensing her approach. Her spear arches down toward his head. The zombie flips onto his stomach and grabs her ankle. His teeth come down on her thick leather boot. The spear connects harmlessly with the pavement. I have to give the girl credit. She doesn't do more than gasp in fear, trying to jerk free while she raises her spear back into a defensive position. I dart in and deliver a vicious kick to the beast's head, effectively dislodging him from the girl's boot. She skips back, leveling the spear for a killing blow. I'm quicker. I sweep the screwdriver in a downward arc, burying it in the zombie's skull. He shudders once, then dies. Blood oozes from the wound, spreading down the head like a red egg yolk. Five feet away, the boys finish off the second zombie, each stabbing the head of the beast in rapid succession. Thanks, the girl says to me. She pauses to wipe sweat from her forehead. That was a good kill. My name's Jenna. I'm Car- Dude, Lila, says the boy with Bob Marley on his shirt. What the hell? You know better than to make so much noise. Lila emerges from behind the cars, clearly still frightened but equally indignant. Dude, Eric, she snaps. I was all by myself trying to clean up the kitchen, and those things practically fell out of the closet on me. I- Mom? I spin around at the familiar voice. A bedraggled young man races across the parking lot. His beard has grown to massive proportions, the longest parts brushing the top of his chest. His jeans are ripped at both knees and blood stains the hem of his faded shirt. Wide, blue eyes, so much like his father's, stare at me in shock. Carter! His name bursts from my mouth. Mom! He says again. You really made it. Carter! I sprint toward my son. The two of us close the distance, dodging around cars and over a few bodies. We practically crash into each other. Our shoes squelch in a squishy pool of dried blood, but we hardly notice. I throw my arms around my son in a bruising hug. He wraps me in an equally ferocious embrace, saying my name over and over. Tears dampen his beard. His, mine, I'm not sure whose. I'm half laughing, half sobbing. My son is alive. He's alive, alive. I grip his face between my hands, studying him, assuring myself that it's really him, that it's really my Carter. That's your mom, someone says. Carter's face splits into a goofy smile, a few tears still shining on his cheeks. He glances past me at whoever's speaking, then back to me. This is my mom, he says, and I'm startled at the pride in his voice. I told you she was tough. It's Carter's mom. The words ripple around me as the group of kids congregate, whispering loudly to each other. She made it, someone else says. She ran over two hundred miles. The students crowd closer to me. There are six altogether, including Carter. Why is she covered in mud? Lila asks, wrinkling her nose. What happened to her arm? Dude, look at her ankle, Eric says. It looks really fucked up. Everyone looks at my ankle, which has swollen to twice its normal size. An uneasy silence falls, as though they've just now realized I'm standing here and can hear everything they're saying. I fell a while back, I offer. God! 
That was nearly a hundred miles ago. No wonder it looks like hell. The mud is for the poison oak. I lightly touch the crooked stitches in my arm, which has scabbed over. I was grazed by a bullet here. You were shot? Carter asks, agape. No, not shot. I make my voice casual, not wanting my son to fret. Just grazed by a bullet. Another beat of silence as the kids look me up and down, taking in my horrific appearance. And likely my smell. Hopefully they won't notice the bits of vomit spattered on my shoes, pants, and shirt. Possibly they'll just mistake it for general grime. The pretty girl with Princess Leia hair clears her throat. We, uh, used your strategy to get rid of the zombies that had massed outside the Creekside Lounge, Jenna says. My strategy? I echo. Your attack and stack strategy, Carter says. The one you used to empty the RV. We wedged open a door with some chairs and tables, Eric says, gesticulating wildly. We made the opening just wide enough for one of them to get through at a time. Then we made a bunch of noise and drew them through, one by one. Carter told us about that time you ran that race in Utah and got caught in a snowstorm for ten hours, says the boy sporting the shirt with the marijuana leaf. We figured if some old lady could do that, we could take care of a few zombies. He cracks up at this. The eyes of the other kids widen as they look from marijuana boy to me. Lila elbows him in the ribs. Johnny! She hisses. Johnny, abruptly realizing what he just said, throws me a look that's half panic, half horror. It's okay, I tell him. I am old. I'm okay with that. It's better than being dead. I try to make my voice light, but for some reason the tension balloons. What Johnny is trying to say, says Afro Boy, is that you inspired us to get off our asses and survive. Yeah, you really inspired us, Mrs. S., Eric says. Then the tension melts away from the group, leaving me speechless. I inspired them? I don't think I've ever inspired anyone in my life, especially with running stories. I'm used to people telling me I'm crazy, not inspirational. Relentless progress forward. Right, Mom? Carter asks, quoting a famous saying by ultra runner Brian Powell. I laugh, swaying on my feet. I'm so proud of you all, I say. A frown suddenly creases Carter's brow. He scans the parking lot as if looking for something. Where's Frederico? He asks. The strain of the last 230 miles comes crashing down on me. My legs buckle. Whoa! Carter catches me, easing me to the ground. You okay? Dude, that's a dumb question, Eric declares. She's just ran 200 miles and has a fucked-up ankle, poison oak, and a bullet wound. Carter glares at Eric before shifting his gaze to the Afro boy. Reed, can we borrow your water bottle? Reed nods, handing over the bottle that had been hanging from his belt by a carabiner. I take a long drink, steeling myself to answer Carter's question. I force myself to look into his eyes. Frederico is dead. That's what I should say. But it's not enough. It doesn't even begin to encompass all that his death meant, all that he suffered on our journey. He's gone, isn't he? Carter says at last. Uncle Rico? I nod, somehow finding my voice. He died so I could get here. Carter scrubs a hand over his eyes. I pull out the melted Snickers bar I'd found inside the jeep we drove out of Laytonville. Uncle Rico told me I should bring this to you. I press the crushed candy bar into his hands. Carter sniffles, once again scrubbing a hand over his eyes. Jenna puts her arms around him. Even in my exhausted state, I see the familiarity and, 
Is that affection? In the gesture. My eyes narrow as I study the girl. Carter catches my look. He pockets the Snickers bar and grabs Jenna's hand. This is my girlfriend, Mom, he says. Jenna. Your girlfriend? I say, stunned, and not in a good way. Since when? Awkward silence descends. The boys scuff their feet behind us. Jenna chews on her bottom lip, eyes flicking between me and Carter. My son looks like I've just slapped him. I take a deep breath, trying to get my emotions under control. Sorry, I say to both of them. It's just a bit of a surprise, that's all. I refrain from saying, you never mentioned her to me, not once, though the look I give him clearly communicates this. Carter scrubs a hand through his shaggy hair. I was going to introduce you the next time you came up to visit. I just didn't expect your visit to come in the middle of an apocalypse. He's got me there. I give Jenna a thorough appraisal. From the smell of things, she doesn't wear patchouli, thank God. A deodorant fan. Not that I'm really in a position to judge another human being by her smell. A closer look reveals blondish tufts of hair poking out from beneath her armpits. I groan inwardly. God, all I wanted was for Carter to meet a nice girl who shaves her pits. Is that so much to ask? There are girls at Humboldt that shave. I've seen them. Seeing apprehension seeping across Carter's features, I realize I've been staring a bit too long. Don't get caught up in armpit hair, I scold myself. Give yourself a chance to get to know the girl. I muster my best smile for Jenna. My name is Kate, I say, extending my hand to her. Nice to meet you. Carter visibly relaxes, putting one arm around Jenna's shoulders. All my friends call her Mrs. S. Hi, Mrs. S. Jenna extends a hand in my direction, offering me a tentative smile. Nice to meet you. Carter's told me so much about you. She laughs nervously. He talks about you all the time. He does? My smile morphs from forced to genuine. Yeah. She relaxes a little. I can't believe all the crazy running things you've done. Carter told us that you run so far that you sometimes hallucinate, Eric says. Is that true? Lila asks. You run so far you hallucinate? Yeah, sometimes, I say. He told us you got attacked by hornets four times at another race, Reed says. He said they flew inside your shirt and bit you all over. The Quad Dipsy. I hadn't thought about that race in a while. Runners ran the same route four times, twice going west, twice going east. And each time I'd passed that hornet nest, the little fuckers had come after me. Just thinking about it makes me itch. Yeah, I say. That sucked a lot. The kids make wordless sounds of awe and approval. It's strange to have them all looking at me like I'm something odd and extraordinary. You should come inside, Carter says. He disengages himself from Jenna and helps me to my feet. We're using the Creekside Lounge for a home base right now. I want to ask him what's happened here. Why so many kids were murdered. How he and this small group managed to survive the last few days. These questions and many others crash around in my head, but I hold back. The answers will be there later. And right now, I'm tired. Really fucking tired. I lean on Carter, letting him lead me to the Creekside Lounge. The rest of the students trail in our wake. I recall visiting the lounge on one of my earlier trips. It's a big room with comfy chairs and a plethora of vending machines. It sounds like a nice place to rest. And maybe take a nap. I could use a nap. As I half walk, half limp toward the building, I let myself appreciate this moment in time. Me and Carter together.
as a family should be. I appreciate our companions, the other five remaining kids, and a decent shelter. Hell, I'm even grateful my son has someone special in his life. I'm grateful ultra-running has given me the strength to come all this way and share it with him. You can't run an ultra-marathon and not learn something about yourself. Throw in zombies, dehydration, crippling hunger, perverted thugs, a murdered dog, masochistic drug dealers, and a dead best friend. The learning doesn't stop, no matter how much I wish it would. I'm a finisher. This is the singular most important thing running has taught me. I am flawed. I am as imperfect as they come. But I have grit inside me. I have the capacity to slog through the deepest, nastiest shit. On the trail. And in life. This is what Frederico was trying to tell me right before he died. I might not be pretty when I arrive at the finish line, but I do arrive. Though it's rarely easy, I find a way out of hard times. This is my strength, my inner beauty. I've finished what I set out to do. For Kyle, for Carter, and for Frederico, I have finished. I don't know what the future holds for our small group. But for the first time in my life, I know I have the strength to face it head on. This has been Undead Ultra, written by Camille Picot, narrated by Gwendolyn Druyor. Copyright 2016 by Camille Picot. Production copyright 2016 by Camille Picot. Would you like another free Undead Ultra audiobook? Head over to my website at www.camillepeacott.com and join the VIP Bunker. Inside the VIP Bunker, you'll get instant access to Dawn Patrol, the Undead Ultra prequel audiobook, completely for free. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to www.camillepeacott.com and join the VIP Bunker. Hope to see you there.